Hi, I'm Steve Wynn. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I produce music. I write, illustrate. I just try to really engage with sonic and visual metaphors to the best of my ability. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of I discovered you through a few people and um, I went onto your Instagram page and was scrolling through all the work that you've done. And I see so many people that I know from very different parts of my life has liked the page, which means they're, they're fans and you have quite a few followers. And I was like, this is so interesting where a person, an artist like you can exist in the world and not everybody knows, but at the same time, everybody who's important to me knows about you. And that says a lot about the work that you've done. Yeah, no, shout out to uh, Dr. Indigo Willing for, you know, connecting us together, Kenneth. It's really, you know, my pleasure, privilege to be on this platform. And I've been listening to the podcast and, you know, it's honored for me to participate and share some, you know, knowledge with you. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. What, led you down the path of design and animation? You know, when I was a kid, I was able to explore my surroundings, right? So, you know, I could leave my house like morning and never come back until like maybe dinner time. So during that time, you know, it's just really getting to understand the world at large, right? So, you know, I'd bring my notebooks with me. I always like carried them in my backpack. Even like now to this day, I still carry like sketchbooks and, you know, notebooks that I write in and stuff like that. And I'll just be sketching what I think is really interesting. Um, you know, I didn't have a camera at the time, obviously, like when I could afford them, I could buy disposables. So I would take pictures of them and I would start, you know, sketching off of the disposable film. Uh, so that stuff kind of was like the basis of my foundation. I also like wrote comics. So it kind of like helped me structure my ideas in sort of panel form. Um, stuff like that, you know, really kind of like helped me understand how I thought because like I was always a visual person. Like I never, I never really read a lot until I guess it was suggested that I read some stuff that kind of helped me formulate my thoughts. So early on, that's pretty much how it ended up happening. And then as I grew older, I just started watching a lot of YouTube tutorials on how people did their work. And, you know, I was just really fascinated by what people were creating on DeviantArt. Um, and, you know, that community was very engaging. You know, they'll, they'll you know, help artists even like just coming up or just kind of like you know people who are already established they'll have that rep you know, rapport with other artists that you know oh like how did you do this or how'd you do that and they'll be willing to share that now it's everywhere you know you can search how to do anything on youtube and then um you, yeah you know, when i started I, yeah i want to jump in real quick uh the thing about what you said about reading is a it's a fine line for me with yeah. artists and the, this line of demarcation between the ones that take up this advice of reading more about things in the bigger, broader world, and it improves their art. What were the books that you were suggested to read? So the one, the one that like sticks out in my mind was The Alchemist, right? It's Paulo the, Coelho. Yeah, Paulo Coelho. Yeah, that was the one that for me early on had a, like a big influence in my life uh, because, you know, it's basically about manifesting, right? At the end of the day, right? It's about manifesting what the universe will bring to you and you have to kind of meet it at a certain point, right? So it's just really about manifesting your goals and the universe will meet you halfway at a certain point if you're willing, right? So. And that's pretty much been sort of like the theme of my life. I feel like, you know, it's just like I never really forced any idea to come to me. It was just what I was exposed to, what I've read over the course of my life. Um, the stories and conversations I've had with people, you know, they've all sort of formulated ideas. Now, you know, I, I, I go back into your Instagram page and, you know, the first video is like, I don't know, 200,000 views. It's not like it's like 10,000 views. It's like it's a lot of views. Did you have more posts before that, that spurned or did you like, did you erase the previous posts? I mean, how do you get 
that it was just mind blowing. And the level of the refine, how refined that piece was from that point to today is very refined in what you've done. So I'm like thinking there was like a whole body of work that we're not seeing before that. Is that right? Yeah, no, I archived a lot of my posts because once I had my daughter, a lot of my content sort of pivoted. So I wanted to focus more on just animation stuff. You know, a lot of the stuff I put up earlier was just like, it would be pictures of me, it would be like rough work, it would be finished illustrations and stuff like that. And then towards a certain point, I just kind of like, you know what, I think I'm going to do something different now. I'm going to try something a little bit different. So now you're, what you're seeing is more music focus and more animation music hybrid focused got it yeah that was uh and i'm not uh, uh somebody who is a specialist in instagram but i just it, you know those kind of things are curious to me when i'm like wow it's a lot of posts for uh, a lot of likes for um for the for that first post now what about the history of who and how you've developed as a as an artist i mean we don't get to we don't get to see much of that uh, when we study something like somebody like me, who's going to do the research about your life and the, 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 the way you've developed, I don't get to see that history. Uh, is there a chance or is there a process that you put all that stuff back on? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think at this point now it's just moving forward and creating more. Um, and I am doing that right now. It's just, I think, like I said, I, I reiterate, like social media for me is, it's different. It's pivoted since you know, I became a parent, just mainly because like, I feel like it's the quality of posts that we put out now. I mm -hmm. feel like now, like social media is just so much out there, right? Like people will post anything, but I really feel like what engages people is either like if you post something triggering where it's like, it starts a conversation either for better or for worse or if it's something that like people have seen but like you know it's kind of like they've never seen that happen before and they've seen it but like they don't know how to do it you know so it's like oh wow like i've never seen that done in that way right so that's that i think that's my approach right like i want to do it in a way it's like oh wow like i didn't know it could be done that way and that's really cool and you know it, it connects to me in a way that like i'm not really saying anything but I feel it, right? It's a feeling. So all this stuff I post now is just more of a feeling. I'm not mm -hmm. saying anything really. And yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's my that's my pivot. So like before it would just be very blatant stuff. I'm like, okay, I would say a caption or I do this or that. And that's cool. But now I'm just kind of like, you know, like I said, I deal with sonic and visual metaphor. So the whole challenge is to really get you to understand the feeling that I'm trying to put out there. That makes sense. Now, this feeling reminds me of this visual audio feeling, the sonic feeling reminds me of like the early Robotech uh, cartoons that I grew up in the 90s, uh, in the 80s, and um, Spirited Away, uh, which is uh, a beautiful uh, feature film, cartoon film, that animated film that just brings you into a whole different sp sort of space. And it also reminds me of the early, um, as I'm thinking about it now, the little prints like this, it's very simple, but it puts you into uh, a mood. It puts you into a vibe and I'm sure your work gets interpreted in so many different ways by so many b different people, but how do you come up with this style? How did you come up with the pieces? That's a good question. And it's really just an amalgamation of things that I've encountered and obviously blended with my own style. Um, you know, I always, I always envision a lot of things in a 2D world. You know, like when I see things, like it's all memory based, right? So things that are memory based, they're tethered to things that are factual and, and that have happened, you know? So it's not like I imagined it like completely, right? These are tethered based memories that I build sort of these visuals off of. So like places that I've been, the conversations that I've had, moments that I've been a part of, you know, those are the things I kind of put together. And that's kind of like how I sort of recreate the style with regards to the feeling of it all. Right. There's a movie that I always talk about called Grave of the Fireflies. Within the first 30 seconds of watching that movie, you get hit instantly and you know that you're in for this like crazy depressing roller coaster. So well, after I watched that, I'm like, I get it now. I get it because there was nothing said within those 30 seconds, but that's what you want 
people to feel when you watch things, right? It could be happy, it could be whatever, but like that is the feeling that you have to get across to people because people want to discover things organically, right? They don't want to be, you know, introduced to it forcefully, right? So that's the whole thing with me, right? Like I, that's, that's why I, you know, I studied sort of how to do this. You know, I've researched many, many, many different ways to do it. And the challenge now is just to do it where people actually care. And what do you think the answer to that is? Why would somebody care about anything that we do? That's hard, you know, because now there's so much out there, right? It's just how do you make people care about anything anymore? And it's just you have to anchor it into a moment, a human moment, where people understand and have felt this this way, right? And it can be through many things like, you know, a passing of a loved one. Like people have felt that, you know, um, the moment that you you know your life is going to change, you know, whether it's like you're about to be a father or a mother for the first time in your life. Like that's a feeling you can't describe, you know, like, and that's what I'm trying to put out there because it's hard to describe in words. But what I've noticed is that like you can do it through music and through visual without really having to say anything. And a lot of times that's what connects me to a lot of people because they watch that and they're like, you know what? That's exactly how I felt. Something mm -hmm. as simple as just going for a walk or something as simple as just kind of like, you know, being in the ocean or something as simple as just kind of like, yeah, it's, there's so many different ways to explain it. But it's all in these moments of silence that we feel it. You uh, have alluded to the music side of it a few times um, so far, and I am wondering uh, how much of the music are you producing and writing for the pieces that you've done? Right now, since 2020, it's been pretty much me um, and my mastering engineer. So for the most part, like I was learning music production through the pandemic, you know, just as a way to kind of like learn a new skill and, you know, kind of build on sort of this puzzle, this missing piece of the puzzle that I've been trying to build. Um, my background is in percussion, right? So that's the, that's the foundation of music, essentially, right? It's rhythm and beat. But crafting melody is a whole different theory, side of theory that, you know, there's a learning curve to it, obviously. So, um, yeah, I've been learning a lot. Like, luckily, like during my time in media, I met a lot of people who are in music who've, you know, obviously been doing it longer than I have. And, you know, they give me tidbits. I sh they're willing to share. Um, and I obviously bounce ideas back and forth with them. Um, and yeah, like it, it's pretty good as far as just overall, like putting these pieces together, this, these tracks. Um, if you listen to my early stuff, it's kind of raw, like rough. The structure is not very, I don't know, it's not, it, it doesn't follow a very, uh, I guess, like the traditional structure of music. Uh, so now I'm just n knowing what I know now. It's 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 a learning curve. But I think now people are starting to understand, oh, like, you know, music doesn't have to be perfect as long as it hits a certain chord with people. Right. So it, it's crazy because uh, like I, like if you're somebody who's just off the street like me looking at your work, I wouldn't know if it's imperfect or the structure changed or anything like that. I just feel like as you go on watching from the earlier post to today, there's just, it just gets smoother. It doesn't, it's, there's nothing jarring about the early posts. It's just, everything's just becoming more, uh, you're just more engaged into the world of the piece that you're, you're, you're experiencing. Yeah. I feel like that's just growth, right? That's just artistic growth. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, will attest to that right but you know they always go back and say like i could have done that better i could have done this better but that's life i feel like you know just you know the journey is you know you you were that person at that time and you have to account for all that just to say that you're not just you you just are you you know one thing i want to do uh when i watch your your pieces is i want to crawl into the screen and walk around into the world that you've created. And I'm wondering if like there is other senses that you wish you could create for us because I crave like, damn, I wonder if Steve can imagine 
if there was another technology where you can insert it in and there's a third sense that we feel right. And I'm like, I would love to, I would love to smell what he is smelling in his mind. And are there things like that, that, what that you want to stretch into beyond the 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 visual i think 2d 3d and the the audio side of things yeah no that's why i'm so fascinated by the culinary space right because i have a lot of friends that are in that space that you know obviously they're trying to cross over to the visual and auditory space right so we we have these conversations like is there anything that can bridge that gap and i think it's just you know it, I, it's not there yet. I don't think the tech is there yet, but I feel like the media is in place for that. Like you can discover these new places that, you know, obviously are trying different things and, you know, obviously going very well and they're using social media and, you know, other forms of media to help them bridge, you know, to, I guess, like other people, right. Like to, to their demographic, the people that are in their area. So yeah, hopefully that tech exists one day. I'm sure with the virtual reality, they'll figure it out, right? Um, yeah, or even a museum space, you know, like a walkthrough four channel uh, museum space where you can walk in your world and experience uh, a very cold feeling or a very hot feeling, or because some of the videos that we 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 can watch, it makes it gives off this certain emotion that if you were in a real space and you were walking around like these Van Gogh ex exhibits in LA, you, you could walk through the world and experience life as you see it. Steven Wynn, Steve Wynn, the artist uh, is experiencing it. That, that would be fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. We are, we are always thinking about those, like those kind of ideas, but at the end of the day, you know, like I said, we, we're only left with the tools that we're given, yeah. right? So, yeah, no, like, that's awesome. You know, like, the immersive space is where you can just kind of, like, mm -hmm. walk through and feel that and look at it and touch it. You know, that's why I think, like, kids' spaces do so well because kids can, yeah. you know, have that Immerse. luxury. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm totally open to it. Like, I've done, I've done art pieces, obviously, in museums in the past, and, you know, they've gone well and, a lot of video work. So yeah, like it's just really like what is next, right? What is the next like five years gonna hold? Yeah. Now, how do you uh determine the length of these pieces that you do? Because I look at it and go, I want more. I wish they were like four minutes, five minutes. So I, I I'm walk more into a story or whatever, but these are kind of feelings and vibes that you present to the world. Like why that specific length? Well, now it's more catered towards the society, right? So, you know, we ingest content at such a fast pace that we just go to the next thing, you know, and you can blame the TikTok generation for that, right? It's just what it is. But um, no, like I've dabbled in long form. It's just that it burns you out so much that I think you need to reset and just kind of regroup and focus what actual content is supposed to be like. I don't think anyone's going to watch a movie on social media anymore. Like, I just don't think that's the case, right? People have trouble binging things now on Netflix or whatever just because of that. So now everything's episodic now. It's not like a two-hour, three-hour movie anymore. I think that's just how it is. It's just what we've just kind of been sort of conditioned into. So, yeah, it's just really adapting to the times. Um, and with, yeah, with social media, I think that's just how it has to be. Yeah. You said you did a feature a length one before? I did, yeah, back in 2012, and that process just about killed us. Why? Okay, so the way that started out was back in 2008, I was connected to a lady that went to my temple from a family friend, right? And she had a very harrowing story about her survival. Um, she grew up in Hiroshima, right? So 1945 Hiroshima, so like, when the bomb happened right so and she tells it so vividly right like she has a unique ability to tell stories so vividly to where like you can see things you can feel things it's weird like i don't know how to explain it and when that happens it captures your your attention very very quickly you know so you know me and my friends we were always talking with her and you know we thought it'd be a good idea to adapt her story into something different we just didn't know how to do it 
just like the way she did it, it was just like it was good but she's not going to live forever so you know i wanted the story to carry through you know as as far as it could you know long before she's here you know so yeah we decided to do an animated documentary just kind of like combining her narratives with sort of this point in time where she was very i guess i guess very active with her story so um only a few animated documentaries at the time had been out around the time and i studied all of them you know whilst with bashir persepolis uh you know even waking life to an extent yeah with you know like that was you know all the philosophical questions and debates and things that you can really you know have in a movie i just condensed it all into a package that i guess like our generation could enjoy and it was done in through this graphic novel style uh format you know so you know it was obviously to stand out and make it different and it wasn't like that at first so that's the whole thing right so it was supposed to be just a documentary with just you know little bits of animation here and there and then it just became a full-fledged animation right so think about 45 minutes of animation that's that's like two years worth of work right there wow yeah so that just about killed us it burned us out like but it was worth telling that story because you, you know it? yeah we did yeah it's up on amazon prime it's um it's been up for a while um uh, we so that that's another thing, right? It was learning all that stuff and, you know, even just like getting the chance to pitch it to networks and stuff like that. That was a whole new skill that I had to learn at the time, right? So, you know, I had an in around that time, but like I wasn't in it. Like as a producer, I wasn't in it, you know? So learning to, you know, take advantage of those opportunities and, you know, securing funding, which like I was really happy about at the time, you know, to make this movie. Um, and then just getting to work in the studio with, you know, the actors, people who were part of it. And then being a part of the production and learning from that point on, you know, where I wasn't like hands on with the animation, but then over time, just seeing it done so many times now, like I can sort of use that software and just kind of, you know, just kind of like go at my own pace. And then, you know, here we are like 10 years later, you know, now I'm doing it and it's kind of like, now I have full control of what I want to put out there. Now, What's the name of the piece? Ibaksha. So that's the uh, term that the atomic bomb survivors are, they gave themselves. So that's the, uh, if, if you want to, it, it's uh, H-I-B-A-K-U-S-H-A. So if you search it on Amazon Prime, it's there. Um, yeah, like we, we toured for two years after that movie came out. Um, and it was really cool. Like it got resounding you know, ovations and, you know, awards. And then not only that, like, I got to do a follow-up documentary after that. So I was in Japan, you know, um, shooting documentaries uh, with the Hiroshima, Hiroshima uh, Peace Museum. So that was like sort of my project with them and Global Zero, you know, the disarmament campaign. Um, so yeah, no, it was really cool. And then, you know, I was back and forth during that time between Japan and Korea. So like during Korea, I was learning art also. I was like being trained um so i was bouncing back and forth during that time so 2014 was a very crazy awesome year and it really formed a lot of the relationships with the artists now that i have and um yeah that was like a whole nother life out there yeah, it was kind of cool I, I didn't even know that this existed you know this whole other chapter of this feature uh for hiroshima you know existed and uh it, it is such a i can't wait to watch it actually um can you spell that one more time just for our audience yeah it's h-i-b-a-k-u-s-h-a -A. yeah it's it's on, it's pretty on cool amazon prime. it's on amazon prime yeah I, I i haven't watched it in a while like the last time i watched it we were showing it at the san jose ja japanese museum japanese american museum yeah and it was cool. Like it was funny because like her family members came out to watch it. I didn't know she had family out there and we had a good conversation and, you know, it was fun to kind of like just revisit those memories again, because I spent a lot of time with this lady. Her name was Kaz. So she lived in my area and I would always go to visit her during that time when we were making this documentary just to get to know her. And, you know, she, she passed away around the time my daughter was born. So it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird how that, worked out like you know we had a nice phone chat like before all that happened and you know it's just getting to you know see how she's been and then you know 
yeah, it was just catching up like old times. And it was cool to kind of get to know her, like, you know, towards her later years. Um, yeah. I miss her though. Like I really do. Like I think about her like every day, you know, wow. cause like I, I drive, I drive by her house, like pretty much almost every week. So it's like, it's not her house, but it's her, her daughter's house that she stayed with her. So yeah, it, it was kind of, yeah. Yeah. You see those, it's those stories, man. It's those stories Kent, that like really kind of resonate because you know, they were real, you know, like I was a part of them, you know, it's not like I just heard it from the grapevine. You know, like, you know, I, I was with her, pretty much for a good year or two, you know, like helping her run errands. She was old, you know, so like I had to take her to hospitals. Like, yeah, it was like, you know, just things that I could do for her, you know, go on grocery runs or like, you know, there's a wiener schnitzel like right down the street that like we, she'd always get coffee and then we would, you know, talk about life. And, you know, I think like my worldview has changed a lot just because of her, you know, because, you know, like when I was when I was younger, I was a very spiteful kid. Like I left this town, like my hometown, I left angry and spiteful, man. But, you know, just having the chance to catch up with her and talk to her and just what she's been through is, you know, is learning forgiveness, right? Forgiveness and not only others, but yourself, right? So, yeah. We, we talked about this idea of veering off the topic and veering off the, 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 the road that that we kind of lay down um, in these podcasts. And I said to you that it's important that we honor veering off. And that's why I kind of don't like sending questions out to my guests, you know, because the spontaneity of what you just told me about cause is so special when it comes up in conversation like this. And how does these things how do these things show up in conversation in real time if we don't allow wandering and veering off to happen into different tangents? You know, it. I, I would have never known about this had I just, and you and me just agreed, hey, these are the questions that we're going to abide by. But just the ability to let the, these things breathe, I think is what's so important about these podcast episodes uh, that we just allow the audience to kind of get a, a look into who you are and the experiences that formed you as an artist. So the half a million people that are on your Instagram page and all of the followers that you have can now get an understanding, a deeper understanding of who Steve Wynn is. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to kind of, you know, letting this format breathe the way it does. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think spontaneity is everything. It's kind of, I think the foundation of how I, do things nowadays right because it's more memorable that way right yeah um, so yeah no no thank you for you know allowing me to share that it's dope because um i i you know these people that are in our lives who are i have a mentor who is uh, 81 and i see him once a month and um i've known him he's my high school english teacher his name is jim and you know i just love being around him i i as much as I can spend the time. And so I can relate to what you're saying about cause. Right. So. No, like it's fortunate that you still have your mentor because when I was in eighth grade, I found that mentor too, but he passed away like shortly after. And, you know, yeah. Like I was going through a lot of, yeah. I don't know. It was those feelings, man. Like I talk about them a lot actually in interviews, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a pain that like, I, I never really understood how to deal with, you know, I, I go to visit his, memorial out in culver city like his site like grave site like once every summer so like i'm about to now but like yeah like those mentors those conversations that we have you know the the feeling that like you know there's actually people out there that will make time for us and yeah yeah it's and you're doing that to other young people today now aren't you i mean that's the reason why you know i feel like we have to pass on yeah our stories not just what we know but just our experiences man like yeah I, I feel like you know life this whole life is really just about like the memories we form right and what we pass on to others so yeah that's what I'm, I'm trying to do my best speaking of passing on our work and our thoughts and our memories and who we are the essence of who we are leads us into this topic of ai right yeah. uh because in essence we have artificial intelligence picking up pieces of our essence visually sonically the stuff that you do because if i typed in to one of these prompts i want uh this to feel like steve wins art 
it'll reconstruct and take from your style. How do you feel about the direction of where all this is going? I mean, every creative industry has had these struggles. They've had to adapt to so many of these technologies that eliminate the middlemen. So I was always an early adopter of these things. Like I knew I saw it coming because honestly, like I saw it happen with the music industry, right? Like back in the day, you had to buy records, right? It's a commodity. It's buy, you know, it's, that's just how things were. And then, you know, when you saw Napster come out and then Kazaa, LimeWire, all these, all these third party softwares, these sharing networks, like you can stop them from coming out, even though the music industry like tried so hard to shut them down. But like, I, I think when the people see a better way of doing things, they're not going to go back to the way it was. I just feel that's just the way it is. So with AI, I feel like the exact same way. Um, I was having a conversation with a lot of artists about this and I told them like Adobe has to license this kind of tech. They have to, they have to. And then, you know, shortly, a few months later, they did, you know, so now, you know, the creative cloud that you're seeing now in beta form, it's allowing for AI to create assets, new assets for people now. And I, for one, like, I'm not gonna say I have a problem with it because I know the the ramifications of what it does for the smaller fish out there, you know, because I was in that boat too. But then at the end of the day, right? Like I look at it and it's like, am I really doing this for money or am I doing this to tell stories? Am I doing this for the love of art? And I feel like it democratizes a lot of that, right? So like people who don't have an art background or people who have ideas, but don't necessarily know how to do it or they're scared to share those ideas well you know now there's a platform there's a tech that can do that and it's not perfect but it will make strides to definitely be better than it was before it's a very generous uh, outlook and generous perspective from from your humanity because you know a lot of commercial artists are like up in arms because it's taking away from their living yeah, no, but that's what it is. I, it's just that's just how it's been. Every creative industry has been shook up in this way. It's it's happened to web design. It's happened to music. It's it's gonna happen in art. It already has actually. You know, um, writing, to a sense, like you know, it's just like people have to adapt, and that's why I preach multidisciplinary art, right? Because ultimately, it all comes from us, right? It all comes from what we put out there already. Um, so that's why like learning music and all that stuff and you know, putting together all this in a sense, like AI can't really replicate that, you know what I'm saying? Like it can't rep replicate me, you know, it can't, you know, it's, it's tough, right? it will be tough for it to do um, if it all comes from me. Um, but yeah, no, like I, honestly, it's going to be better. I feel like, you know, there's really no point in fighting it at this point. I hope, I hope that makes sense because, you know, the people who fight, progress have it the worst it's mm -hmm. hard it's, it's a hard it's a hard pill to swallow but then you know i come i come to sort of terms with reality and just told myself like i i never got into this because i was trying to take someone's job or like i'm trying to make money off of this like i never did i, I put myself in a position early on down the line where like i could set myself up to where like i could just chill for like the next like few years and just do this just as expression, right? So like, I'll take it back to social media, right? Like what you see, what I'm putting out there, it's not promoting anything. It's not promoting a product or anything like that. You know, and I think that's why it's genuine. You know, people like, oh, this guy's not trying to sell us anything. He's not trying to sell us like his music. He's not trying to sell us like his like influencer shit. Like, you know, it's just like, it's really just about him. And that's cool because like, I feel that way too. I just never knew how to express it in that way. Well, that's let's... something yeah. Let, then let's take it back a few steps then, because yeah. in order to get to where you are right now with that sort of altruistic outlook about your art, yeah. you have had to have come from a place of, I'm not saying comfort, but more of a stability where you arrived at a point where you don't have to worry about how to feed your daughter, or your son, or your family, right? You you had to have maybe stumbled upon a way to say, you know, I'm not worried about this anymore because it's coming in. But in order to get to that point, how was it? Did you have a game plan as an artist? Yeah, no. It, so 
that's a funny story in itself. So back around high school, I want to say like after my junior year, I, I kind of figured it out. Like once you're in a system for a while, you kind of figure out what this is all means to like, you know, because ultimately if you can't compete with certain people academically, <laughs> right? Like you're going to have to find ways to do it financially or other ways. Like, I don't know what it is. So that was my whole mentality is like, you know what? Nah, like I'm going to, I'm going to write this down and then I'm going to try to hit every goal on this list. It's like a manifesto, right? Like, so junior year, I was just a very, like I said, I was an angry, spiteful kid. Like things were just all happening at once. Uh, I didn't grow up in necessarily the best financial conditions. Um, you know, parents had to work full time. Right. So, you know, I saw it as an opportunity to just explore and just kind of like understand like what the game plan was. So yeah, like I, I started writing down all these things. What what were some of the things you wrote down in your checklist, your manifesto? Buy a house, um, buy this car, uh, have a family by before thirty, like stuff like that. You know, like very realistic things because I saw it, I saw it done. You know, like if I, if I could see things, like if, if I saw people accomplish those things, I know it could be done. You know, and. Stuff like that, you know, and it's just like, what is the means to all this? Right. So, you know, when I was 16, like um, I got a part time job, you know, because I, I was a design fiend. Right. I was playing with Adobe Photoshop like 6.0 during that time. So, you know, I was already versed in design. So, you know, there was a company that was hiring Career Center. They put out, you know, post. The only bad thing about it was it was in Irvine and I live like down the coast. Like so I was like an hour some drive. Right. So that was like the only downside because, you know, you get to fight that four or five traffic. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, like I was doing that while I was going to high school, um, you know, and around that time, it was actually not even like traditional part time. Like they would pay you like thirty five an hour, which is like pretty good, good that's money. That's a lot for, of money. That's a good like because it was it was a skill, you know, it was a skill that not a lot of people had. And this was a time when the Internet was booming. Right. Like it was post 2000. Right. When mm -hmm. the dot com boom happened. Now everyone's on, you know, on these apps. So everyone's trying to, you know, get on the web now. So, you know, like that's what it was. Like in this, when I was in school, I was on web design. I was on newspaper. So we were already playing with these, you know, with these software already. And then, you know, I was doing coding at home because I wanted to learn how to build, you know, I want to learn how to build like things and stuff like that. Just web-based applications. So like that was my background early, early in high school. And I just saw that as a means to just, you know, make as much money, just capitalize on as much as I could at the time. So, like, I didn't really have much of that life, that high school life going into junior, senior year. And then even, like, going into college, I was still working. So, you know, it was hard just kind of, like, figuring out how to balance that work-life schedule. Because, like, I missed out on a lot, you know. And I was talking to a college friend earlier. And I was like, dude, I missed out on so much. But I, I, I was just like, man, you know, I was, like, sharp. I was like, this is this is just like, no one's going to deter me from this. Like, you know, because, you know, while everyone's having fun, like dating and like, you know, going out and just being kids, that was just not my, it was just not my MO at the, you know, at the time, you know, I was just but looking back, do you regret that? Do you regret not get, living out your high school and your youth? You know, I'm, it's funny, right? Because like, I'm talking to a lot of high school people now and it's just like, they have the same regrets, but they wish they had started early. So maybe like I was onto something early, you know, because now you can look at it as an adult and in retrospect, oh, like you were actually onto something. And I was like, yeah, I may have seemed stupid at the time, but like, no, no, I was laser focused. Like I, I just, I just knew that this wasn't it, you know, like, and I think, you know, I was always creative. Like, I, I think like just, I was never vocal about it when I was a kid. Right. Um, but yeah, no, it was just, that's just how it was in early on. And, you know, um, after college, like during a summer, like I was in a creative writing workshop at USC. You know, so, you know, I was doing a lot of technical writing in high school, but that kind of helped expand my creative writing. It was like about a six to eight week program. And a lot of people in that class were going on to do MFAs for film and television production and animation. So I kept in contact with those people because around the time that they were doing their thesis you know they were just like all hands on deck like anyone that's like willing to help you know i'm i'm all for it you know so allowing me to have those connections and just kind of like understanding sort of like that's how things work right because if you're in that industry for a while like either you stay where you are or you 
promote yourself or like something's going to happen. Like, and that's just generally my luck, right? Because, you know, the friends that I made, they got on to do really cool things later down the line. So yeah, no, it's, it's just funny, but like, yeah, in high school, like I think just things worked out. And then when it hit college, I think it's just having those friends that are also creative and doing things that like you'd want to do and them allowing you to be a part of it. I think that's just kind of mm -hmm. like, the key all the yeah it's just alignment right yeah. at the end of the day everything just aligns perfectly it's amazing it's amazing how uh you had the vision early enough to to see because now i'm i'm like well you know you're putting out all this time to to create these pieces but you know i think about the monetization side of it but that like you already thought about that years yeah. ago Oh yeah, no, absolutely. No, because I knew down the line, you know, everyone's in this boat together, right? So we had to figure out a system where we can all sort of, you know, help each other out. And that's really, that's really it. You know, like the communities that you're in, you know, like I think if we can help each other sort of at a certain point, you know, even like if, if we're starting out or doing something like that, like there has to be people that have been there already that are in a successful, you know, in a successful space to help others come up. Like I, that's what I try to do like one-on-one. -on -one. I don't necessarily do that with like a group of people. I'm not like, am I like on a, you know, platform or pedestal, like, you know, grandstand, like, you know, Hey, like listen to me and all that stuff. No, it's really just about like having these conversations. If people are willing, you know, people don't want to be force fed information. Like they want to, you know, like I said, they want to gradually be aware of it and discover it on their own. What, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you these days? it's it's everything i think you know like without the events that have taken place like i wouldn't be here you know um yeah like i'm trying to do right by those stories that i've heard those conversations um that i've had with not only parents uh, other vietnamese folk friends you know colleagues uh we all got here you know through some crazy circumstances um and like personally, like as a storyteller or as an artist, I, I felt like I could never do that story justice on my own, you know, because I'm a byproduct of the war, right? I'm a byproduct of everything that happened that preceded that, you know, and yeah, it's just different for me, man, you know, like, you know, so I try to do right by the stories that I hear and I, I'm very respectful. Um, yeah, no, it means it means everything to me. You know, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to really put it into, that's, that's the thing I don't really know how to put it into words either, but it's yeah. who I am. Yeah. Cause you're, you see things on a, on a visual and a, an audio sonic level and, and stepping into these worlds that you've created, we could clearly see that your mind operates on a uh, visual and audio uh, level. Yeah. Uh, and there's no dialogue uh, for the most part, right? No. So for this upcoming music video that I'm doing, you're going to see a lot of it. And yeah, there is no dialogue, obviously, but it's just moments and things that happened um, based on perspectives. Um, yeah. So that's really all I can really share until it comes out. But yeah, the, the whole goal, honestly, is to, you know, what can I tell you without really telling you anything? You know, because like, I don't, I don't think people really want to be you know, spoon fed what I give them. I think like they can, there's the audience, whoever watches it, they're smart enough to understand what it is, you know? And, you know, if you can show it to them and they understand it, then I did my job. Yeah. Have you been to Vietnam before? Yeah. Yeah. I have when I was 20. So it's been a while. I'm like 37 now. So it's been a while. And, you know, like when I got there, yeah, it was different. Like, I, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I think like I don't know how to describe it, but it's kind of like a place that you've been you you have to have gone to like or like it's a place like I've been wanting to go my whole life. Like you know, I feel like a lot of people feel that way w with their homeland or their hometown. Like I didn't grow up there though, but like I, I felt it. Like th that's where your roots are. But let me ask you this, Steve: mm -hmm. Is that the first country overseas that you went to on vacation that you willingly went to, or did you no. go to another country? Mm -hmm. No other countries, but that was probably maybe like the third. Okay. What yeah. is the first country you went to because you wanted to vacation or you wanted to go check out? Uh, I think well, Italy. Asian country? 
no, no, it was Italy. I think it was Italy. Yeah, it was Italy. You know, Rome. You know, um, yeah, and, yeah, and Florence. I, yeah. I asked this question because I'm beginning to ask that question uh, quite a bit now within my own family and friends. That you know, I was at a at a uh, family uh, uh, Father's Day. It was like uh, a lot of my cousins and you know, one of the cousins were like, I'm going to Japan. I'm like, well, you've never been to Vietnam. Like, why would you go to Japan? He's a grown ass dude. He's like 30 something. I'm like, what, why would you not go to Vietnam first? He's like, I don't know. It's just not really. And I really pushed it too. I said, like, really, what, what really holds you back from going to Vietnam first? And I don't want to challenge you and, and put you down, but no, 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 that, that, okay. No, I get it now. I get, I get it. Yeah. There's a fear, dude. I think there's a fear. Because of all the stories that we heard and, you know, how people, uh, even parents, how they portrayed it, mm. because obviously it's a traumatic situation. They never dealt with it the right way. So, you know, as kids, you hear, like, stay away from there, communists, stuff like that, right? Like, so there's a very entrenched history of negativity mm. that they didn't necessarily deal with. But I feel like now, obviously, with doing more, like, things have changed, you know, like, there's been a reformation process over the course of time where now it's like things have, you know, it's more business focused and more tourist. Absolutely. Now, which I understand now, like I, and that's why when I went back, I'm like, this is not like how I expected it to be at all. I thought you guys like, yeah, you portrayed it like in the worst of ways. So like, no, it was, it was just like, it was weird to see because like what I saw was beautiful. What I saw was beautiful. Obviously like it's not perfect, but it's like, it was, it was great. Like, and that's 17 uh, years ago. Yeah. Right. So 15 years ago for you. It is so different now. It is some of the parts of Vietnam are so magical the way they've recreated it. And, you know, the way they rehab the, 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 the feelings that you step into some of these like areas and it's just a, an amazing place. I always advocate, advocate for, for young people to, to go there first, you know, instead of these other countries, go check out your, your mother, your motherland first. Yeah, my sister and my mom went not too long ago and I was kind of jealous because like that was around the time my daughter was like two. So yeah. like I would have, I would have, but uh, yeah, no, it was, yeah, no, I was jealous. But like I wanted to go back recently. Um, I haven't traveled anywhere really since, I like overseas since the pandemic. So, you know, just things have gotten so busy. Um, it's on, it's on my to-do list though. It is, it is definitely. That's like one of the things that like, like I said, like I wrote things down, right? Like when I was a kid, that was one of the things like to go there, to go to Vietnam. Like what, what is on your manifesto to do list from here to the day you stop working? Like, what do you want to accomplish? Everything is honestly being there for my daughter. That's it. Like, that's like, I, I think I finished like 80% of it. And you know, the rest of it is really just passing on what I have to her. And that's just going to be another work in progress, you know, because, you know, I, I want, like I said, I want to show her, that it can be done and that her dad can do it. And now she's doing something crazy, you know, like, like I wrote my children's book for her, you know, and I didn't think in, in ever in my lifetime, I would get a publishing deal just because, you know, that, that space is just so competitive and it's just who reads anymore. But, you know, I, I showed her that it could be done, you know, and she sees my book in libraries and like it's in her schools and stuff like that. So wait, how, how did now, that all come about? Dude, I got my my book publishing deal through Twitter, actually. <laughs> dude, I know, no, it's it's crazy, right? Oh, because exactly. I got I got through Twitter. It's like the most randomest thing ever. But like I, I tell people that dude, like I didn't submit a manuscript. I didn't apply to anybody. Like I didn't even have a lit agent at the time. Like, yeah, it was just through Twitter. I retweeted like a friend's book and it did really good impressions and they reached out to me as like, Hey, are you working on anything? And I'm not going to be like, no, no, I'm not working on anything. You know, like, yeah, you know, like the Hollywood answer is like, yeah, I got a bunch of ideas. Yeah. Here, you know, like just give me like a month to like figure it out, you know? And you know, that's really kind of like how it started. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. So I know a, a, a book proposal in a month and you submitted it and it, and they gave you an advance and yeah. you went to town and worked on a book. Yeah. Yeah. And it's out now and it's cool because like, I never thought in my wildest dreams, that's not even on the list too. Like it's like, right. Like, like, who's going to care. Is, right. But like, this no, this is crazy, man, because, um, you know, 
I come because, you know, your Instagram and Indigo and, you know, uh, have, I have a very vested interest in the work that you do from what I've seen visually. But then, you know, you have like a movie on Amazon, right? That I just, you know, like how much, you know, it, that's that's like a very difficult thing to do. And now, you know, you, you've actually had a, a children's book published. And yeah. so it's almost like your life is not, those kind of things are not planned, it seems. No, no. Never forced, never planned, never reached out to anybody and said, Hey, like I got this idea. Um, I mean, like I have done it a few times, like to just like close friends, but nothing like of this magnitude. So yeah, no, it's, it's really cool. And you know, because of that, like my daughter now is like doing her own books, you know, so, so like she, she gave me this like first edition copy, right. Of her book, like the mischievous llama. Wow. Dude, like, I don't even know if she knows what mischievous is and I don't ever think she's seen a llama before, but like this book is hilarious, man. Like, but you know, it's just the thing. Like if you show kids that it can be done, they'll do it, you know? Like, yeah. And I, I think she has the tools to do it way better than I ever could. You know, and that's really what I'm trying to pass on. Steve, it's going to be uh very interesting to, to watch what you do in the next few years. Thank you for coming on today. I, I had a blast and learned a lot about you. Dude, it's, you know, these talks, man, you know, I, I you know, I, I appreciate it so much. Um, you know, thank you for the forces that have allowed us to connect um, the people that have put us together. You know, I'm grateful for these moments. And, you know, I, I appreciate the conversation, Kenneth. Thank you. And please reach out to me um, once the next project you have. I, I think uh, there's things that you, uh, there's a lot of big projects, I think, that are going to be brewing for your future because, you're still a very young man, and I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of stuff, a lot of work inside your creative uh, mind. I hope so. You know, I'm just I'm just grateful that I'm able to enjoy this journey while I can. You know, because like I feel like time is, you know, we look at time differently now. You know, especially after the times that we've dealt with, like pandemic and seeing loved ones go. Ugh, you know, so yeah, no, I'm appreciative of this time as always, and I'm I'm hoping forward to looking the next few years also and seeing what it has in store. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.